Is the gift of speaking in tongues today a counterfeit gift? Stay tuned to Bible Line and find out. Welcome to Bible Line Ministries with Bible Prophecy Expert, radio talk show host, and pastor, Dr. Hank Lindstrom. Over the next half hour, enjoy as Dr. Lindstrom takes you on a journey through the scriptures. Now, Dr. Hank Lindstrom. Welcome to the program. I'm Dr. Hank Lindstrom, your host. And we're going to be talking about the scriptures. And if you have your Bible nearby, get it out and maybe turn to the passages we'll be turning to. You might want to also jot down some of the references so you can look them up later. And also, you might want to look at my Bible as we show it up on the screen as we look at some of the different verses. We're talking about the modern-day tongues movement, which we believe is a counterfeit of the real gift of tongues given at Pentecost. The real gift was a specific language. In fact, the Greek word dialectos is used which tells us it was a specific dialect of a specific language. And uh, today what people are doing is a gibberish that no one understands, not even the person speaking it. So therefore, how can it be really the gift that the Bible speaks about? In fact, all the world religions do it. Uh, The uh, Hindus do it. People in Islam do it. Buddhists do it. It's done in all kinds of cultures and uh, all kinds of tribes in many different countries. And it's even done uh, by the cults. The Mormons uh, do the gibberish. And is that of God? I don't believe so. Uh, Does God give this to people who reject the Bible, reject Christ? If it's the real gift, how could it be? The answer is, this is a false gift that is worldwide and is a part of the end times deception the Bible said would happen. Jesus said in Matthew 24, 24, in the last days when asked what would be the sign of his coming, he says there shall arise many false preachers and they would show great signs and wonders, miracles, insomuch if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. Wow. So there Jesus tells us to watch for false preachers in the last days who would do signs and wonders. Nowhere in the scripture does it tell us that genuine preachers would do signs and wonders in the last days. That signs and wonders were a temporary uh, gift of the Holy Spirit at the beginning of the age as there was a transition from the Jewish people, Israel, being God's witnesses, to the Gentiles being God's witnesses. We are really witnessing the end time uh, false teachings that the Bible said would take place. The signs and wonders would be signs really of uh, a serious departure from the Bible and apostasy among different denominations where they really have gone astray and most of their people probably do not even know Christ as their Savior. And I know that can sound just so wrong if you're in one of these churches that does the modern day tongues because you say you believe in Christ. But if you are saying that you could lose your salvation, then really you're not because you're really saying that you're the Savior, not Christ. You know, if you could lose your salvation, you're saying that from this point till when you die, you have to live the Christian life successfully. And then you'll go to heaven. But if you don't and you backslide and you die, you'll go to hell. That means how you live your life determines your salvation. The Bible says salvation is not of works and therefore you do not have salvation. You're the Savior because salvation is dependent upon how you behave and it's not uh, dependent upon what Christ did for you and finished at the cross. You know, when Jesus died, he said, it is finished. And that is, he finished the work of salvation. When you trust Christ at that moment, he gives you everlasting life. One of the symptoms of major doctrinal departure is the gift of gibberish today, which 
those who have it generally have numerous other doctrinal errors and generally their major doctrinal error is that they can lose their salvation which really is uh, a subtle subtle thing because those who are involved think they're trusting Christ but really when you just take a close look at it they're really trusting themselves because they're saying that ultimately how they live their life will determine whether they're saved or not. I'm saved by the blood of Christ. My works have nothing to do with my salvation. In fact, the Bible says in Romans 4, 5, to him that does not work, but believeth on him that justifieth the ungodly Christ, God will count your faith in Christ for righteousness. In Ephesians 2, 8 and 9, it says, by grace, by mercy, are you saved through faith? This salvation is not of yourself. It's the gift of God, not of works, lest any man should boast or brag. So God's plan of salvation is not of works. It has nothing to do with your works. It has to do with what Christ fully and completely accomplished on the cross of Calvary. The gibberish not only is not being used uh, to accomplish what the real gift was to accomplish, but is a complete counterfeit. You know, the real gift of tongues was to be used for evangelism. It was to be used around lost people. 1 Corinthians 14, 22. Let's take a look at it, and I'll uh, let you look at my Bible as we look at this. But it tells us tongues were for a sign. 1 Corinthians 14, 22. Wherefore, tongues are for a sign... Not to them that believe, not to them that believe, but to them that believe not. So tongues were assigned to those that don't believe. It was to be used around unbelievers. Now, I have never yet had anybody want to go with me out in public and use their gift of tongues among unbelievers. They know that what they're doing is not assigned to unbelievers, and people think they're crazy. They usually just use it in their church. And then they generally say this is a prayer tongue that, uh, for communication with God. And of course, that's a cop-out. There is no such thing as a special prayer language to talk to God. If you live in America, God understands English quite well. You don't need to pray in some secret, secret decoder language to communicate with God. But yet, those who do the gibberish try to say that it is a secret prayer language. You know, one of the verses they try to use to support that is verse 2 in 1 Corinthians uh, chapter 14. It says, He that speaketh in an unknown tongue. Notice the word unknown, and I've got it scratched out, is in italics. That means it's not in the original manuscripts. What the translators did when they added this word was try to let you and me know that this was a known language but unknown to the hearer because the Corinthian believers were misusing the real gift. So it says here, He that speaketh in an unknown, that is unknown to the hearer, speaketh not unto men, but unto God. And here's the answer, why? For no man, what? Understandeth him. If you were to speak, for example, in an English-speaking church, and you were to speak in Russian, then you would be speaking in a language unknown to the hearers, and therefore, you'd be speaking not unto men, but unto God, because nobody understands Russian, generally speaking, in a English-speaking congregation. And so the people would say, "Howbeit in the Spirit he speaketh mysteries. They would say, what in the world is he saying? I have no, no comprehension. And that verse is not saying that uh, there is a, a gibberish that's unknown that is speaking, uh, used to just speak to God. It's just saying that God knows all languages. And when the real gift was still in force, that if they misused it and used a foreign language that the people in church didn't understand, then uh, only God would understand it and no one else would because nobody would understand them. The whole point in Corinthians here is the real gift was to, use to be used to communicate. Notice what it says in verse 8. The Apostle Paul here says, If the trumpet give an uncertain sound, who shall prepare himself to battle? 
It used to be in the battlefield that they would use the trumpet to signal to troops what to do, to retreat, to go forward, to charge, and uh, uh, they required the trumpeter to give a clear sound or the troops were confused and didn't know what to do. So likewise ye, except ye utter by the tongue, and look at this, words easy to be understood. Words easy to be understood. If you don't do that, then how shall it be known what is spoken? You just speak into the air. Well, the modern movement, the gibberish, is just speaking into the air. Nobody understands it, not even the people that are doing it. So this is not a prayer language. And there is no such, such thing as a secret prayer language. There's another verse that generally those who do the gibberish use. It's over in Romans 8. And it talks about the Holy Spirit interceding on our behalf. Look at this verse. It says in verse 26 of Romans 8, Likewise the Spirit also helpeth our infirmities, for we know not what we should pray for as we ought, but the Spirit, it should read himself, maketh intercession for us with groanings which cannot be uttered. And people make these groanings and strange sounds and gibberish, and they say that's the Holy Spirit praying. That isn't true. Because look at what it says in the last phrase, which cannot be uttered. If there's a noise that comes out of your mouth, that's not the Holy Spirit. The Holy Spirit intercedes with groanings which are not audible and cannot be heard by anybody. Now, I've, I've had people pray and uh, they would moan and groan and say that was the Holy Spirit uh, groaning and moaning and praying and interceding on their behalf. And I said, no, it isn't. And they would say, well, yes, it is. I said, no, it isn't. And I would use this verse and I would show that the groanings of the Holy Spirit can't be uttered. They're not audible. So whatever you're doing, it's not God the Holy Spirit. I think you're just groaning. And uh, it's not, of course, a secret prayer language. There's nothing in the Bible to support uh, that there's a secret prayer language. And by the way, God understands English. Why do I need to come up with some secret decoder language to be able to talk to God when uh, even if I did, the people who claim they have it don't understand what they're saying. So how in the world do they know what's going on? They don't. And obviously this is a counterfeit. I've had others say that uh, this is an angelic language. It's a, a language that angels speak. And they use the verse in 1 Corinthians uh, 13 where it says, Though I speak with the tongues of men, and of angels, and have not love, I become as sounding brass and as a tinkling cymbal. Well, the tongue of angels, what is that? It's actually speaking here of eloquence, because uh, there is no secret language that angels have. You know, whenever you look in the Bible, whenever angels spoke, they always spoke in the language of the hearer, and were excellent communicators. You can't find me any example in the Bible where an angel spoke and somebody didn't understand that angel. You know, when the angel appeared to Mary in Nazareth to tell her that she was pregnant with the Lord Jesus Christ, the angel didn't come upon Mary and say, and Mary didn't say, oh my God, what is he saying? Uh, the angel said, Mary, you're highly favored among women. She understood everything, including that she was pregnant. And she said, I don't know a man. How can this be? And the angel explained how that the Holy Spirit was the one that impregnated the egg in her womb and caused her to conceive. And the child that she would bear would actually be called uh, the Son of God because God was the father of that flesh that she was about to bring about into this world. There's no place in the Bible where angels ever spoke and were not understood. They were excellent communicators. And so for people that tell me that they speak in an, in an angelic tongue, I would say then you really ought to be understood because angels always speak in the language of the hearer and are perfect communicators. The modern gibberish movement is exactly that. It's a false movement. It's a part of the deception of the last days. And Jesus said to watch for this. In Matthew 24, 24, when asked what would be the sign of his coming, he said there's going to arise false preachers 
And these false preachers are going to show great signs and wonders. Insomuch, if it were possible, they would deceive the very elect. Now think about it. Who are doing the signs and wonders today? According to Jesus, it would not be genuine believers. But those that are false preachers would do signs and wonders. And many people would be caught up in it and deceived by it. They would deceive even genuine believers, the elect because it would be subtly done. Well, I think we're watching that movement right now. I think the signs and wonders movement is a sign that we're in the last days and that Jesus said in the last days false preachers would do the signs and wonders. I'd be suspect of anybody that's doing signs and wonders today because God said that false preachers would do them. Matthew 24, 24, look it up. Verse 25 is interesting because Christ said, Behold, I've told you before it happens. He's given us 2,000 years warning to watch that at the end of the age, false preachers would come along and do this. And by the way, the modern day tongues movement started right about 100 years ago. In fact, I believe this year is the 100th anniversary of the uh, tongues movement. So this is a counterfeit movement that really signals the return of Christ and we're living in the last days. I really hope and pray that you are saved. The most important doctrine in the Bible is that of salvation. And Jesus died and paid for your sin debt in full so that you could be sure of going to heaven from the moment you believe and forever thereafter. You know, once you become saved and you become saved at the moment you believe or trust Christ and you're saved from that moment on forever and ever and ever and ever and ever, Christ will never cast you out. John 6, 37. Christ would never lose you. John 6, 39. Christ promises in John 10, 28, I give them eternal life and they'll never perish. That means you'll never go to hell and neither shall any pluck them out of my hand. In other words, you can't be lost once you get saved. John 10, 28, John 6, 37, John 6, 39. Look them up for yourself. But many, many today say they can lose their salvation. And as soon as you say that, you really are admitting that you're the Savior, not Christ. And you're trusting how you're going to live your life out so that you can make sure that you're saved and go to heaven when you die. And that if you don't live your life out living the Christian life and you backslide and die, you'll go to hell. That means you're the Savior. How you live your life determines your salvation. If you believe you can lose your salvation, I don't believe you're saved. And that's a tragedy that many people have bought into this deception in the last days. Right now, if you've never done it, you need to trust Christ as your Savior. You can do that by just telling the Lord, Lord, I'm a sinner. I'm unable to save myself, and I trust in Jesus Christ as my only means of salvation. I believe He paid for all of my sins, past, present, and future, at the cross. And by the way, when you uh, think about it, when Christ died, all of your sins were future. You weren't even born yet. He died for you, though. He saw your life in the future transpire and paid for every sin you'd ever commit. When you trust Christ, as the one who paid for all of your sins, God saves you. And you're saved forever. And He promises He'll never lose you. He'll never cast you out. You'll never perish. Neither shall any pluck them out of His hand. John 6.37, John 6.39, and John 10.28 are the ones I was quoting. Why not just tell the Lord, Lord, right now I trust Jesus alone as my Savior. Not counting on myself or my future but counting on Christ and what He did for me at the cross. And God will save you forever. And from that moment on, you can be sure of going to heaven. You know, we have lots of resources in our Bible and Resource Center, including lots of teaching on this topic and many other topics. And you might want to order our CDs or DVDs that cover some of this, but also we have some wonderful books and other resources. You might also want to send a gift to Bible and to keep us on the air. And you can do that by calling our operators and giving a gift by credit card or going to our online bookstore. I'm Dr. Hank Lindstrom. Take a look 
at some of the resources as we present them, and maybe we have some things that will help you grow and get the truth. Let me introduce to you some of the resources that we have in our Bible Line Resource Center that I think will be a real blessing to you. We have DVD presentations of our television programs, which each one covers a particular doctrine that you can use for your personal study and enlightenment on that doctrine. Plus, we have CD series of 10 or 12 hours of teaching each that will greatly aid you in studying books like the book of Revelation or Daniel and many others. About 40 different series are available. Plus, we have this wonderful evangelism uh, series or set here, which is uh, the free ticket tracks, 500 tracks, plus this book that actually tells you how to talk to an atheist, an agnostic, a cult member, a family member, and lead them to Christ. For a minimum gift of $20, you can get these uh, tracks and the evangelism handbook. Also, we have the Strong's Concordance. This is a marvelous tool for studying your Bible because it gives you every word in the entire Bible and by a number code system, the original Hebrew or Greek word from which it came and what it means. It's wonderful for Bible study. For a gift, a minimum gift of $30, uh, we can ship this uh, to you and it will help Bible Line uh, to stay on the air. Also, in addition to the Strong's Concordance, we have the Bible that I like so much, the uh, Schofield Reference Bible. This is called the King James Study Bible. The, the notes are by Dr. C.I. Schofield. It first came out in 1909, and the notes are really great because they are uh, geared to the Bible questions you might have relating to doctrine and uh, issues that you'll be facing when you're... Uh, uh, learning and then talking to others about the Bible. Don't miss out on these wonderful offers. You can go to our website and see them online and order on our online bookstore by going to BibleLineMinistries.org or .com. And you can also call our operators and they'll be glad to assist you in uh, reviewing whatever products you've seen here, resources you've seen, and maybe you'd like to order them directly over the uh, telephone. Just go ahead and call our operators. They're standing by and they'll be able to help you. And you can also give a gift to help Bible Line uh, to stay on the air in your area. In any case, we're very concerned about where you'd spend eternity. And if you have been uncertain or you have doubts, maybe you've never really understood what the Bible says. The Bible makes it very clear that we're all sinners. Every one of us are deserving of hell. But God so loved the world that He gave His only begotten Son, Jesus Christ. And Christ went to the cross of Calvary, taking your sins and mine upon Himself, paying for our sin debt in full by His death and shed blood, such that all of our sins, past, present, and future, were paid for in their entirety. The hymn writer said it so well when he said, Jesus paid it all, all to Him I owe. Sin had left a crimson stain, but He washed it as white as snow. When you trust in the finished work of Christ at Calvary, God then gives you the gift of everlasting life because He fully purchased it because He paid for every sin that you and I would ever commit, past, present, and future. And at the moment you believe, you receive everlasting life and therefore you'll have it forever. It's not temporary life or probation that God offers, but it's everlasting life. And if you have it right now, as the Bible teaches, it's a present possession. You'll have it tomorrow, next week, next year, 10 years from now, 100 years from now, a million years from now, a billion years from now. You'll have it forever and ever and ever. So you can be certain of going to heaven from the moment you trust Christ as your Savior. And if you've never done that, just whisper a prayer between you and the living God and tell Him, God, I admit that I'm a sinner. And we all are but I believe Jesus Christ paid for those sins in full by His death, burial, and resurrection. And I trust Him right now to save me, to forgive me, to give me the gift of everlasting life. And the moment you trust Christ, God saves you. I did that when I was 18. A year later, I made a second decision to serve Christ. And that's where rewards and blessings and joy comes in. And so you might be a believer, 
But then if you are, you need to make a second choice where you serve the Lord. You see, rewards are attained by our works and our deeds, and they're a future attainment because rewards are not given out until after we have died. But if you are a believer at the moment of belief, you receive everlasting life and can be assured of heaven. But then the Bible says, lay up for yourselves treasures in heaven, which come about by living for Christ. And I believe some of our resources will really help you in uh, growing and knowing what the Bible says in these areas. You might find out what teaching sets that we have on DVD and video and CD in audio teachings that will help you grow and really become a dynamic witness for Jesus Christ. But if you've never trusted Christ, just whisper that prayer between you and the living God and tell Him, God, I admit that I'm a sinner, but I believe Jesus Christ died and paid for those sins in full by His death and shed blood. I trust Jesus Christ right now to forgive my sins, to give me the gift of eternal life, to be my Savior, to be my only hope of heaven, and God will save you. Then you need to make a second decision that will bring about rewards and blessings in your life now and in eternity that come about by our faithful service. But our uh, salvation is never in jeopardy. It is not based upon our works. And once you trust Christ, we have the promise in John 6, 37, that Christ said He would in no wise cast out anyone that has come to Him. And He says that He would not lose one that has come to Him in John 6, 39. I hope you'll take a look at our website, BibleLineMinistries.org or .com, and also write down the phone number on the screen and call our 800 number, and our operators will be able to help you uh, be able to find our website or maybe order some of the resources we've talked about or maybe explain to you how you can be sure of going to heaven if you have doubts or confusion about what is required to get you into heaven. I'm Dr. Ang Lindstrom, and I hope you enjoyed Bible Line, and I hope you'll tune us in each and every week, and also to know that on the Internet, you can tune in our radio program 24-7, and I hope you'll take advantage. God bless you. Have a great week. We look forward to seeing you next week right here on Bible Line. been watching Bible Line, a presentation of Bible Line Ministries of Tampa, Florida. Your donation to Bible Line makes it possible for this ministry to continue. Bible Line's address is 4811 George Road, Tampa, Florida, 33634. To order from Bible Line, call our toll-free number at 1-800-576-3771. That's 1-800-576-3771. Or visit Bible Line online at BibleLineMinistries.com or .org. Be sure to watch next week for another edition of Bible Line from Calvary Community Church in Tampa, Florida.